Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I'm Professor Azizur Rahman, and in our series of lectures on venereal heart disease, we are going to talk about aortic stenosis today. And I'm sure you can recognize this valve. This is aortic valve. This is the normal aortic valve, which consists of three cusps. Three, three cusps. This is also called inverted Mercedes-Benz sign. Uh, Sometimes these two cusps, they fail to separate from each other congenitally and one may end up having a bicuspid aortic valve. A bicuspid aortic valve is a relatively common condition as a cause of aortic stenosis. In our part of the world, still the commonest is rheumatic, but in other parts of the world, in developed world where rheumatic valve disease is less common, bicuspid aortic valve disease is still common. Now this could be asymptomatic, maybe just an incidental diagnosis or it could be symptomatic or maybe initially asymptomatic and later on it may progress to frank aortic stenosis or sometimes also additional aortic regurgitation. This cartoon shows you the structure of this valve and this is the location of aortic valve. Left ventricle pumps its blood into the aorta through this valve. Normally, this valve opens during systole, the blood to allow blood go from left ventricle to the uh, to the aorta, and during diastole, this must close so that blood does not regurgitate back into left ventricle. So, whenever there is a valvular disease, aortic valvular disease, it could result in stenosis, or occasionally it could result in regurgitation, and sometimes both. So we are going to examine aortic stenosis today. Etiology, uh, it could be congenital in the form of bicuspid aortic valve disease or it may be rheumatic and when it is rheumatic it is usually in addition to mitral valve disease. Somehow rheumatic process affects mitral, mitral valve more commonly. So the clue is if somebody has aortic valve disease and there is additional mitral valve disease also, it is likely to be rheumatic. But if it is isolated aortic stenosis, especially if you have detected bicuspid disease on uh, echo, it will be congenital. Then sometimes senile, that means with age, the valves, they get damaged, they get calcified, they get fibrotic and occasionally you may have senile aortic stenosis also. And then there's a condition called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now, strictly speaking, this is not a valvular disease, but some clinical features are very similar to aortic stenosis. So I thought I would cover this condition also, but very briefly. I, we will have a separate video on cardiomyopathies. Now, this is the aortic valve. You can see, imagine you are looking at the aortic valve from the aorta side, not from the ventricle side. So this is very, very thickened, roughened, deformed and narrowed valve. So this is definitely a post, this is an autopsy specimen, a very, very uh, d d diseased valve. Uh, this is uh, the aorta. Okay. I think this is the most important slide and if you understand this pathophysiology, how the hemodynamics develop in aortic stenosis, it will become very easy for you to understand all the clinical features and the laboratory abnormalities, echocardiographic abnormalities and the treatment plan. First of all, there is left ventricular outflow obstruction. That is what aortic stenosis is. Now, because of left ventricular outflow obstruction, left ventricle would have concentric hypertrophy. That means the left ventricular wall will thicken inward. The wall will become thickened, but the cavity size will become small. So stroke volume will be reduced. So not only the stroke volume is reduced, there is obstruction. So and patient may develop syncope. One of the classical symptoms of aortic stenosis is syncope that develops during exertion. Now, why during exertion? When normally when we do exertion, uh, two things happen simultaneously. simultaneously. One is there is vasodilatation to allow more circulation because we need more circulation during exercise. And number two, there is increased cardiac output because of course, again, we need more cardiac output. 
Now, when there is aortic stenosis, there is a peripheral vasodilatation, uh, sympathetically driven, but there is no increased stroke volume. There is no increased cardiac output because of the stenosis. So that is the time when the pressure, the systolic pressure drops and that leads to brain ischemia and that causes syncope. One classical symptom of aortic stenosis is exertional syncope. Of course, there are many other causes of syncope, but if somebody says he or she develops syncope only during exertion, that would be very suggestive of aortic stenosis. Not only that should give you a clue to the diagnosis, you should also know that once a patient with aortic stenosis develops syncope, the life expectancy is less than five years. So that has got a prognostic value also. So this would lead to concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. And you know, left ventricular hypertrophy, we always see as potential ischemic uh, problem. The reason is that muscle may hypertrophy to one and a half to two times to even more than two times. But the capillaries, the coronary arteries, they do not proliferate. So there is always left ventricular wall ischemia when there is severe concentric hypertrophy. This could manifest in the form of uh, T wave inversion and ST depression, sometimes described as left ventricular strain, but I think we always see it as potential ischemia. That may manifest in the form of typical angina. So if somebody develops angina, and somebody with aortic stenosis develops angina, and then the life expectancy is then reduced to less than three years. So we are getting late. I think we need to take action before patient develops syncope. If that we have missed, then before somebody develops angina, because life expectancy is now limited. Later on, left ventricle initially is hypertrophied and trying to compensate for the additional load and it does manage to compensate for long time, maybe sometime for years and decades, but ultimately left ventricle will fail and symptoms of left ventricular failure will develop, typically dyspnea. Now once somebody develops dyspnea, somebody with aortic stenosis develops dyspnea, life expectancy is now restricted to less than two years. So that means patient is now getting very close to the, the death. So I think we are now getting late. In fact, if somebody is diagnosed at this stage, when left ventricle has already started dilating, the surgery I might not be very helpful or if at all, it would have minimum benefit. So I think it, it is our responsibility as physicians that we diagnose cases early. So if every patient coming to a doctor for whatever condition is given a proper physical examination, you can very easily pick up the cardinal sign of this condition, the classical murmur, I think nobody can miss. It should, so certainly it is possible to make an early diagnosis. If, if uh, you can make an early diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, echocardiography can be done and then surgery or whatever other treatment is needed can be offered. So this is the pathophysiology. If you have understood this, uh, I think you would be able to understand the rest of the things very easily. Physical signs, uh, the symptoms of, uh, I've already told you in the form of that uh, earlier slide, there is history of syncope, there is history of angina, there is history of dyspnea. And what are the signs? There may be the pulse, when you examine pulse, you may find anadiacrotic pulse. What exactly is anadiacrotic pulse? Is a pulse which is low in volume, but can be uh, you can easily identify that it is bifid. It has got two uh, uh, heaps. So I think that is anadiacrotic. Initially it was called anadiacrotic, but now we call it anacrotic. I must admit that this may not be an easy sign to pick up. But when you examine apex bleed, there would be sustained heap because left ventricular systole time is prolonged. That is why it would be sustained. And because left ventricular contraction is much more forceful than normal, so it would be heave. Heave is when you put your hand on the precordium, you have the feeling as if your hand gets lifted with every systole. So that is heave. And if your hand gets lifted and stays there for some second, few sec milliseconds, that would be called sustained heave. Apex heat may also be deviated, but not, 
not significantly because in aortic stenosis we normally get concentric hypertrophy apex b gets deviated when there is left ventricular dilatation which occurs in aortic regurgitation in many other diseases but not exactly in aortic stenosis in heart sounds the second uh, sound the aortic component of the second sound would be soft the easy way to remember is that the aortic component of the second sound is produced by the closure uh, by the uh, closure of the aortic valve and since the valve is diseased so the closure is not perfect uh, sorry opening I'm, I'm so sorry because the second sound the opening is not uh, normal so that is why that the second sound is soft then there is a reverse splitting of second sound now in my next slide i will tell you what exactly i mean this is a very interesting thing but may not be easy to pick up again but one thing which is easy to pick and which is the cardinal sign of aortic stenosis is the classical murmur you really need to be deaf to miss this murmur this murmur is so loud and so uh, easy to pick up i think even with minimum experience you should be able to pick up this murmur or at least you should be able to pick up something some murmur and uh, if you can do that then maybe further test will uh, reveal the proper diagnosis now we are going to talk about the reverse splitting first and then the classical murmur now this is what i mean by reverse splitting this is the normal situation in a normal person the second sound consists of two components, the aorta component and pulmonary component. This is called A2 and this is called P2. 2 referring to the second sound, A referring to the aorta and P referring to the pulmonary component. And you can see that the aorta component precedes pulmonary component. Okay, so this is what normally happens. And in aortic stenosis, now first thing is why reverse splitting? The first thing is that since there is stenosis of aortic valve, so left ventricular systole is prolonged. Left ventricle is contracting, but since blood is not getting out from the left ventricle easily, the systole is it takes much longer to complete. So once systole takes longer, the aortic valve closure will also be prolonged. So the second sound, the aortic component will be delayed. And in this case, since the aorta component is delayed, the pulmonary component actually uh, precedes. So, aorta component follows pulmonary. In this case, there is first aorta component, then pulmonary component. In this first the pulmonary component, as shown in this picture, pulmonary component precedes aorta component. Now, when you are auscultating, you may not be tell actually, you may not be able to tell which one is the uh, pulmonary component, which one is the aorta component easily. But in a normal person, the component which comes first, we presume that is aortic and the one which comes later is pulmonary. But in cases of aortic stenosis, the things get reversed. Now, I will explain uh, further uh, why it gets splitting in during inspiration. You know, in, during inspiration, uh, when we take deep inspiration, there is negative pressure in the chest. So, negative pressure will suck blood into the chest. So, right ventricular venous return is increased, whereas because of the negative pressure in the chest, the venous turn to the left ventricle is reduced. Now, you imagine since we are talking about the left ventricle, so let the venous turn to the left ventricle will be reduced in a normal person. So, when left venous turn to the left ventricle is reduced, the systole becomes shorter, the systole becomes a relatively uh, but it's cystic completes relatively early so the aortic component comes even earlier than its expected time since right ventricular venous turn is increased right ventricular contraction right ventricular cystic gets prolonged so the pulmonary component comes even after so this is what happens during inspiration the aortic comp component which comes first comes even earlier the pulmonary component which comes late comes even later so the difference between aortic and pulmonary component is increased now this i'm explaining the normal mechanism normal split of the second sound during inspiration but in aortic stenosis since pulmonary component and aortic component have changed their places they have reversed their changes at the places so although the aortic component will come earlier the pulmonary component 
will come later but since they have changed their places they get actually closer during inspiration so i hope i have explained this point so during inspiration in a normal person there is the split between aorta so the split of second sound becomes wider and patient with aortic stenosis the split bit of the second sound becomes narrower reason because the pulmonary and aorta component has exchanged their places although the uh, in this case also the aorta component will come earlier than its time and pulmonary component will come later than its time but since they have exchanged their places the split will become narrower i hope i have not made things more complicated for you uh, so if you can remember this i think that will help in your clinical practice now this is a characteristic of murmur of aortic stenosis the murmur is systolic ejection i'm sure you know the various types systolic murmurs diastolic murmurs this murmur is systolic and is ejection in nature because and and this is also called crescendo decrescendo murmur it is also called a diamond shaped murmur you will realize this when i show you the another slide and the picture of this murmur the graphic representation of the murmur it is loud and harsh and sometimes may be associated with a threat any murmur which is loud and can be associated with threat threat means when you put your hand on the chest you can feel that murmur and this murmur is best heard on aortic one area aortic one area is uh, the second intercostal space uh, left to the sternum so that is aortic one area the murmur is best heard here and but it, it radiates to the neck so i think when you are examining the precordium and if you hear a systolic murmur on the base of the heart immediately you should uh, examine the auscultate the neck if the murmur radiates to the neck very strong suspicion that this is actually a murmur of aortic stenosis to differentiate it from murmur of uh, pulmonary stenosis and it may also increase on exp expiration all murmurs they which arise from the left side they they tend to increase during expiration so this is a description of the murmur but in the next slide i'm going to show in a graphic form the murmur so this is the normal uh, state of the affair this is the first sound and this is the uh, systole and this is the diastole and you can see uh, that there is a murmur this is the murmur we call it crescendo decrescendo murmur because it starts after the first sound it increases in intensity reaches its peak in the middle and then decreases in intensity so this is crescendo the increasing part decrescendo the decreasing part crescendo decrescendo murmur this is uh, the murmur of uh, uh, the murmur of aortic stenosis uh, okay now on ecg uh, ecg has some limitations ecg may show left ventricular hypertrophy which means the qrs voltage will be increased and it may also show st depression and t wave inversion that is a sign of left ventricular strain or left ventricular ischemia on xa you may have cardiomegaly there may be prominent ascending aorta and there may be cardiomegaly and if somebody has left ventricular failure there may be some pulmonary infiltrates or pulmonary edema echocardiography and doppler that is extremely important because without echo and doppler diagnosis is never definite and you certainly do not know some of the details which we want to know before we undertake further treatment so echo and doppler examination is extremely important cardiac catheterization uh, in aortic valve disease it is a routine practice to do cardiac catheterization because there may be concomitant coronary artery disease particularly because coronary arteries they arise just from behind the coronary cusp the, the cusp of the aortic valve so actually the fibrotic process which had affected uh, uh, the valve could actually also may, might have involved coronary ostia so that is why angiography is done because many patients would need uh, some something for the coronary artery also when they are, the valve is replaced uh, let's talk about echocardiography in some more detail uh, 
I think I missed this slide. Okay, treatment. Balloon valvulotomy. In patients who have bicuspid aortic valve due to uh, congenital disease, a catheter is passed through some of the artery, the brachial artery, the femoral artery, and we go right into the uh, aortic valve and balloon is passed into the uh, aortic lumen and then it is inflated and that uh, opens up the valve. But this would be suitable only in those who have uh, pure aortic valve disease and otherwise uh, suitable because of course there are many situations where this procedure might not be right. Somebody who had very very bad valve, calcified valve, there is a risk of rupture so I think um, of course this is not my area of speciality. So those patients who are suitable cases, those cases of aortic stenosis who are suitable cases, they are offered balloon valvulotomy. But those where the valve is very, very badly damaged and that they should be offered a valve replacement, especially those who have additional uh, aortic regurgitation also. Then endocarditis prophylaxis, any valvular or congenital heart disease, endocarditis prophylaxis is usually done. That means these patients are prone to develop endocarditis whenever uh, they undergo some surgical procedure. Now depending upon the site of the procedure, there is a risk of uh, bacteremia and then subsequent uh, uh, that uh, bacteremia may be followed by endocarditis. Bacteremia will occur, uh, uh, the bacteria will be uh, based on the site of the procedure. Somebody undergoes dental procedure, the bacteria would be different. Another person goes colonoscopy or some urogenital procedure, the bacteria would be different. So accordingly, we choose an antibiotic, which is usually given intravenously, usually started 24 hours before the surgery and usually continued 48 hours after the surgery to, to prevent any bacteremia and prevent bacteria settling on the valves and ending up in, the, in, in this endocarditis. Now, although uh, because the, some, some physicians, some cardiologists, they sort of do not believe in this endocarditis prophylaxis, they have stopped doing it, as, uh, but we still practice it. Then thromboembolism prophylaxis. Patient with valvular disease, whatever valve, there is a risk because there is a turbulence of flow, there is possibility of clot formation and that clot may get dislodged and can end up anywhere. Uh, it could end up in brain, it could end up, end up in some peripheral uh, limb. Uh, so uh, usually these patients are given some anticoagulant. Although we have very uh, new, uh, long list of new uh, anticoagulants, but if somebody has valvular heart disease, the uh, anticoagulant of choice is still warfarin. Warfarin is a difficult drug to manage, but uh, we need to give them, especially if these patients also have some rhythm disorder. So let's now talk about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Uh, as I said, this is actually not a valvular disease. This is a type of cardiomyopathy, but since the cardinal symptoms and cardinal signs are very similar, in a way, it is a form of uh, left ventricular outflow obstruction. So that is why I have still included one or two slides here. Now, this is the normal heart, left ventricle. You can see the, the thickness of the left ventricle. This is the normal thickness. And there is an open track into the aorta without any obstruction. This is the aorta valve. Now, in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, left ventricle is hypertrophic. This is a, a type of myopathy. It is hypertrophic and there is asymmetric hypertrophy on the septum. So this part, the septum part is more hypertrophic than the rest of the ventricle causing obstruction to the left ventricle outflow. So see, this is obstructing the way to the aorta. So that is why the features of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy will be very similar to aortic stenosis. Now, what, is, what are the differences? Uh, the murmur is the same, systolic injection. In hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, there are some additional clinical features, but I am just going to talk, talk about the cardinal 
uh, sign that that is a murmur. Now this murmur increases uh, in certain procedures and it may also decreases in certain procedures. Now certain clinical maneuvers we call them. So when you oscillate the patient, auscultate the patient, while you are still auscultating your stethoscope on the uh, aortic one area and you are concentrating on the intensity of the murmur, you ask the patient to stand up, you will see that the murmur, murmur increases when patient stands up. Why? Because when patient stands up, the venous turn reduces because when you stand up, because of the fact of gravity, more blood stays in the leg veins, less blood comes to the heart and less venous return to the left heart. That means the heart size become smaller and the left ventricular outflow tracts become even narrower. So the murmur increases on standing. And then Valsalva, when you ask a patient to do Valsalva, that means you close your nose and exhale forcefully, building up positive pressure in the chest. So after first few seconds, in the second phase of Valsalva, the venous return to the heart is reduced because no venous return is coming to the, uh, to the lung. You have increased pulmonary pressure, blood is not coming to the chest and not going to the left side. So the venous return to the left heart in, uh, decreases after first few seconds. And because the venous return to the left heart is, is reduced now, again left ventricular size is reduced and the left ventricular outflow tract is further narrowed and the murmur is increased. Whenever patient is dehydrated, again left ventricular size will be reduced and there is a possibility the murmur will be increased. Medication that reduce left ventricular size, for example, vasodilators, nitrates, these, these drugs can actually worsen symptom and they can also increase the murmur. Now there are certain conditions where the murmur may reduce in intensity. Leg raising. Patient is lying supine and you are auscultating the patient and you are assistant, you ask somebody to raise patient's legs. So when you raise patient's leg, just opposite happen. What, what happens during standing? Just opposite happens. Venous turn to the heart increases. So, so there's a increased venous turn first to the right heart and the same blood goes on to the left side. There's increased venous turn that increased venous turn increases left ventricular size a bit so the left ventricular outflow tract opens a bit the murmur reduces in intensity then squatting position you ask the patient to sit in the squatting position in the initial phase when you sit in the squatting position all your blood in the veins because of that position uh, when you compress your leg veins the blood is like pushed into the central part and the venous turn increases and right left ventricular size increases in size left ventricular outflow tract opens up a bit and the murmur decreases then a hydration just opposite of you hydrate the patient you put a drip and you increase the flow the murmur will reduce intensity and the medication that increase left ventricular size like for example beta blockers and verapamil some other calcium channel blocking agents these drugs, I believe, uh, avabradine will also maybe do because that reduces heart rate. So anything which reduces heart rate and also reduces left ventricular contractility may increase left ventricular size and may reduce the murmur intensity. The treatment is conservative. Uh, in the previous slide, I just explained some of the clinical features and it is always very, very uh, rewarding experience to be able to make a clinical diagnosis. Of course, those clinical features will be very helpful to differentiate uh, murmur of aortic stenosis from murmur of hocum. But of course, ultimate is echo. In any valvular disease, echo is the final. In, in hocum particularly, uh, uh, echo is very very uh, essential before we undertake the treatment. Now treatment may be conservative. Patient with aortic stenosis there may be sometimes just an incidental finding. You patient came for some other reason and you auscultated the patient you found a murmur. Maybe just an incidental diagnosis. Patient may be absolutely asymptomatic. This patient would of course need a regular follow-up but may not need any treatment. 
and patient with hocum may be helped by giving beta blockers and calcium channel blocking agents because these valves these patients they they the, when the left ventricular size increases then they the symptoms are also reduced so beta blocker or calcium channel blocking agents sometimes even in combination septoplasty is procedure uh, where uh, there are various techniques they inject alcohol they sometimes create myocardial infarction by ligating a coronary vessel branch of uh, septum so by, by using various techniques or sometimes they shave off some part of the septum so they actually uh, do plastic surgery on the septum to make it thinner to open up left ventricular outflow tract so these are the various techniques of course further discussion on this would be beyond my scope uh, and the, also the beyond of scope of internal medicine as an internist if we are able to make a diagnosis of aortic stenosis or hocum and we are able to refer the patient to a cardiologist i think we have done our job fairly well but we do we have to do it early in the natural history of these diseases because once things are uh, prolonged uh, then there is a possibility of complication thank you very much this has been professor azizur rahman uh, from Madistan and uh, we have covered uh, another condition today in velvet heart diseases. I really look forward to see you in my next video which will be on aortic regurgitation. Thank you very much for your uh, watching.